Vampires are among the most well-known villains, and sometimes heroes, in fiction today. While no one can pinpoint the precise origin of vampires in folklore, you probably know that the modern notion of the vampire was largely shaped by Bram Stoker's Dracula, whose title character was inspired by the real-life medieval Prince of Wallachia Vlad Tepish or Vlad the Impaler. Since they're usually portrayed as unholy creatures of darkness, it makes sense the vampires would shun or be hurt by sunlight, crucifixes, and holy water. But many of the commonly understood vampire banes are less easy to comprehend. Like, why does garlic repel them? Why are stakes to the heart an effective way of stopping them? And why can't they cross running water? It wasn't that long ago that people thought vampires, or at least creatures of the night similar in some ways to what we would call a vampire, actually existed. Because of that, most of the ways to stop a vampire were real cures proposed by real people. So today, let's dive into why appetizers from your favorite Italian restaurant might serve to keep a vampire at bay. Garlic is probably one of the best known ways to keep a vampire in check. To understand why that is, we'll need to get into a little science. Garlic gets its trademark odor and taste from the chemical element sulfur. Garlic contains several sulfur compounds whose odor is activated when the garlic is crushed, chopped, or chewed. And that smell can linger for a while, as you know if you've ever smelled the breath of someone who's just taken advantage of the unlimited breadsticks at Olive Garden. So are vampires just sticklers for fresh breath? Not quite. Instead, let's switch gears and talk a little about porphyria. When a person contracts this liver disorder, organic compounds called porphyrins build up in the blood and they can produce several adverse effects in high quantities. A person afflicted with porphyria might experience chest pain, abdominal pain, vomiting, or constipation. Their urine might turn a reddish color. Porphyria sufferers can also develop extreme sensitivity to sunlight, possibly even forming blisters after brief exposure. Their gums might also recede, which could give them the appearance of having fangs. And notably, they become extremely sensitive to sulfur compounds, such as the ones found in garlic. Combine all that with the red shaded urine, clearly a sign that the person has been drinking blood, and you have many of the hallmark traits of a vampire. Rare as porphyria is, people suffering from it in pre-modern times were probably shunned for their odd appearance and behavior, and more than a few are likely branded as monsters. So hanging a few cloves of garlic by your door was an easy solution to keep those so-called vampires out of your home. One more note, since porphyria victims aren't likely to look all that great while with the bad skin and teeth, they tend to avoid mirrors, which might explain the myth that vampires don't cast reflections, along with the fact that old mirrors were backed with silver or the notion that vampires didn't have souls. While a stake through the heart is often cited as a common way to stop a vampire, the exact location of the stake varies depending on the part of the world the myth comes from. A stake through the mouth or through the abdomen was more common in some parts of Eastern Europe. Regardless of where it goes, staking a vampire will stop it dead in its tracks, or in some myths destroy it completely. Though when you get right down to it, a stake through the heart would be pretty effective at stopping you or me too, so why is this an especially sound tactic against vampires? Even today, some people claim to see loved ones after they've passed away. This was no different in the past, though people returning from the dead were viewed with more distaste back then, especially if there were diseases or other strange deaths occurring in the area. When that was the case, the only logical solution was that the dead person was rising at night to create havoc. And when their body was exhumed, they looked plump and relatively healthy, fangs glistening with blood, and with hair and fingernails having grown noticeably. In reality, receding flesh and gums from the decomposition process explains the supposed hair and fingernail growth and the presence of longer, fang-like teeth, and ruptured blood vessels accounted for the presence of blood on the corpse. Gases from decomposition tend to accumulate in the torso, which is also why the dead person might have seemed well-fed. To keep the undead menace from rising again and causing more death, the body or parts of it, especially the heart, might be burned or otherwise destroyed, but sometimes a stake might be driven through the corpse to kill it or just keep it in place. This was also a practice in areas where people were buried without coffins so that the body wouldn't rise up through the fresh grave during a heavy rain. When a corpse was staked, gases might be driven out of the body through the vocal cords or the anus, producing a sound and thus proving that the vampire was indeed still active. After all, dead people don't fart. 
As I said previously, it makes sense that vampires would be repelled or damaged by holy water, but why is it that they usually can't cross ordinary running water, like a stream or a river? The answer is surprisingly simple. In many cultures, water is seen as pure. You see it used in many holy rites, such as baptism. Vampires are decidedly impure, so even water that hasn't been blessed by a priest stands against their nature. Running water in particular is more pure than standing water, which can become stagnant and dirty. Water is sometimes portrayed as repelling or obstructing vampires rather than damaging them in much the same way as garlic. But there are exceptions, the most humorous of which might be a scene in Hammer Films Dracula 80 1972, where a vampire is killed after getting knocked into the bathtub in his apartment and accidentally turning on the shower. Maybe he just shouldn't have paid the water bill. You may have heard that one way to delay a vampire is to spread seeds or grains of rice on the ground near its grave or coffin. The vampire will be compelled to stop and count the grains, thus stopping it from chasing you, and if you're really fortunate, it will still be there counting when the sun comes up. A form of this myth exists in many cultures throughout the world, though there doesn't seem to be a consensus on the real-life reason why this belief is prevalent. One of the best I've heard is that vampires are creatures of order and they can't stand the chaos of a bunch of randomly scattered seeds. That might be a modern interpretation, based on the suave appearance of Stoker's Dracula and other recent vampires, but tales of spreading seeds go back much farther, so the real reason behind this behavior is probably hidden deep in the past. A similar compulsive behavior, sometimes attributed to vampires, is that if you get one of their socks and hide it, they'll be forced to search for it. This comes from the Romani myth of the Molo, a kind of vampire slash revenant. Then there's the Chinese vampire, or Zheng Shi, which can only move by hopping with its arms outstretched. This behavior seems to be a combination of the restricted formal clothes it traditionally wears, along with plain old rigor mortis. In fact, Zheng means stiff. So the next time you encounter a vampire, which I'm sure is something you're concerned about, remember these tips for dealing with them and try to engage them in conversation about the historical reasons behind their weaknesses. If you're lucky, maybe you'll bore them into leaving you alone. If that doesn't work, and you've made the mistake of inviting them into your home, just try shoving them into the bathtub. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, click those like and subscribe buttons, and leave me a comment to let me know what aspect of gaming you'd like me to dig into the real history of next. See you later.